Hello, everyone. Welcome into another episode of the Guilty as Charged podcast here. I'm your host, Alex, here for Bolt Breakdowns. We are getting back to doing regular shows tomorrow uh, when we will do our top 10 quarterbacks list. And you guys can all see where we'll end up ranking Justin Herbert. Uh, I don't know how much of the news we are going to get to on that show, which is why I wanted to do this episode today. But we are getting back to normal shows tomorrow. Uh, on the 26th when we do our top 10 quarterback show. So I thought I would let you guys know that off the top when Steven and Tyler are back from vacation. But I did want to do this video talking about some of the news and the notes of the week that maybe we missed uh, while not recording episodes because I do think there are a few things that were worth talking about. Uh, so the first, I do want to mention this Justin Herbert interview from CBS. Um, I believe this came from Jeff Kerr. Uh, of CBS, and he talked to Justin Herbert about a couple things ranging from, uh, you know, not making the playoffs and people taking that criticism. I asked Justin Herbert what he thought of that, but uh, out, out of the things that I thought were necessary to say uh, or were important from this interview, Herbert talked about his contract. Jeff Kerr asked Justin Herbert uh, what he thought about contract negotiations and contract talks going into his third year, and Herbert responded basically by saying he was fine with kind of whatever happens, uh, you know, that will be up to, you know, uh, the negotiations and what happens at that point. But he says that he's not concerned with any future contract talks at this point. Whatever happens, happens. I'm just so excited to be here and play football, which I think is the response that we all expected. Um, I, I don't think we can expect any kind of holdout situation with Justin Herbert next season. I think that this deal just gets done when it gets done. Um, and the Chargers and Herbert seem to be on amicable terms there. I thought that this was worth pointing out just in the vein of what, uh, you know, the media circus around Lamar Jackson's negotiation has kind of been recently, right? You're talking about all these quarterbacks that have gotten paid and are going to get paid uh, as a result of, uh, of, as a result of the market jumping, really. So I thought mentioning Justin Herbert in that context, because the media seems to continue talking about the contracts that him and Joe Burrow and all these guys are going to get down the road as the cap continues to jump and as the importance of the quarterback position, you know, could never be more important than it is now. So uh, nothing, you know, super crazy here, but I do think Herbert's comments on that were worth mentioning. Uh, Herbert also had another comment that I think is not the first time he said this, uh, but he did seem to kind of reaffirm uh, something that people have thought for a while. So in the context of like Joe Burrow and some of these guys that maybe the Bengals, uh, Joe Burrow pretty much has confirmed that the Bengals asked him, you know, about Jamar Chase, uh, draft picks, you know, that kind of moves, just moves as a franchise and have asked for his opinions and his inputs based on that. Um, and uh, Justin Herbert in that same vein, when asked if the Chargers have asked him for his input on free agency and the draft, has said this. Uh, the great part about the Chargers is that they have asked. They definitely want to keep communication open there, but my response is I just want to play QB and I trust you guys. I know you guys are going to get things handled. Uh, so, uh, you know, as a follow up to this, he did say that he trusts uh, Telesco and everybody in the front office 100%. So, you know, pretty much that they have his full backing. But I thought it was interesting just in the context of like a Burrow and some of these franchise quarterbacks, uh, you know, being asked whether they are OK with, you know, certain moves or what they think about certain moves. I think it is good that the Chargers have made that clear with Herbert, that even if Herbert isn't willing to give his opinion or if Herbert, uh, you know, doesn't want to give input, at least they're asking for it. And I think that's a very good thing and very healthy thing for it their relationship going forward and like we just talked about with the talk of a contract extension potentially. Um, okay, Jeremy Fowler had a weird bit on ESPN this morning uh, where he just kind of, you know, shout out a couple chargers, uh, buzz notes that he's been hearing around the league. I believe he was on during the 7 a.m. hour of SportsCenter. I was just tired and I was watching and, and you know, wrote down a couple of the things he said. Uh, so he talked about a couple of the things he's heard about the Chargers. So I was the one who tweeted this on the pod account simply because I didn't expect Jeremy Fowler to just drop Chargers nuggets today. Didn't really expect it to happen. Uh, but in that 7 a.m. hour of SportsCenter, he did talk about uh, he had talked 
talks to someone on the coaching staff who said that this is the best offensive line that the team has had in years. Um, and that was a really interesting quote to me. You know, he did kind of reaffirm that, yes, they still do have to work through the Pipkins and Norton thing. Who's going to end up playing right tackle? But even with that, even with Zion Johnson, a rookie starting at right guard, they're really confident in this offensive line. Uh, and that's been, you know, the buzz about this offensive line for quite a while that the Chargers do believe in it. Uh, and this is, you know, seemingly the best they had in a while. Now, you could kind of counter this point, and Steven and Tyler uh, kind of mentioned this on Twitter, which is like, technically the offensive line was better last year. Like if you look at the starting unit, right? For the 10 seconds that we had Brian Balaga, <laughs> right? Uh, you had a line of uh, Brian Balaga, Ode Bushi, Corey Lindsley, Matt Filer, and then Rashawn Slater. And unfortunately that didn't last particularly long and, and Storm Norton was thrown on the game, you know, th uh, thrown in kind of on a swivel there. So, uh, you know, that didn't last particularly long, but if you're just talking about an on paper offensive line, I do believe that one was technically better. Um, but, you know, if you're kind of relying more on one of Pipkins or Norton to stay healthy and you believe they can give you half of the production or half of the theoretical production Brian Balaga was going to give you, that's something. And I think the fact that they seemingly trust Zion as much as they trusted O'Day going into last year uh, or O'Day during the season, I think that's a big thing going forward that maybe not enough people are talking about. The, the fact that there are questions on the right side of that line and they're still as confident as they are, um, you know, seems to be that they are not going to bring in any free agents for the right tackle position. You know, uh, we'll see how this develops, obviously, during training camp. We'll see how this progresses throughout the regular season. But for now, the Chargers are confident and, you know, say people in the coaching staff do say that this is the best offensive line the team has had in years. Uh, Jeremy Fowler also mentioned that the coach staff does love Khalil Mack's ruggedness that he brings to the defensive line, which I thought was kind of an interesting quote. Nothing crazy there, of course. Uh, we know that the coaching staff loves Khalil Mack, in particular Brandon Staley. Um, but I, I think the fact that, you know, they're talking about the impact that he has had on the team already, just through a mini camp and just through some OTAs, uh, I think is a very positive sign going forward. And it's also very positive going back to Joey Bosa's press conference or mini camp that he felt the need to be here with Khalil Mack, with Kyle Van Noy, because of the potential of a championship run uh, and, you know, all the things that come with that. And also Giff Smith <laughs> applied a little bit of the pressure and said, hey, get over here because we need you to be here right now. But I, I do think talking about what Khalil Mack has done for this team, what Kyle Van Noy and some of the other guys and new additions have brought to this defensive line, the edge that they bring to the edge position, um, is worth noting, and I think Fowler reaffirming that uh, made me feel quite a bit better about the defensive line. Uh, and he did mention at the end that the Chargers and safety Derwin James aren't in talks on an extension, which is something that we've heard uh, for about a month, two months now. Obviously, uh, Tyler Dragon of CBS, uh, I think he's from CBS, right? He's mentioned it before. We've heard other reporters say that you know the Chargers are in talks with Derwin James, uh, especially after the Mika Fitzpatrick contract was given out by the Pittsburgh Steelers. So th this isn't necessarily new news, but good to hear that both sides are still going back and forth. It's better to hear something than hear nothing as far as contract extensions go. And I would still expect in the same way that we saw Keenan Allen get an extension in 2020, in the same way that we saw Joey Bosa also get an extension that year, that this is a deal that gets done probably a little bit before the season starts. Uh, you know, I think that both of them were extended in late July, early August, but I have a feeling that this Derwin James extension gets done in about the same way. Uh, so yeah, that is not anything crazy, but we'll see what the money ends up amounting to. But I think the fact that both sides are still on good terms are in talks on this extension uh, is a very good thing going forward for the Chargers. Uh, the Chargers are now one month from training camp today. When I'm uploading this video, it is June 25th. Uh, so I think that is uh, the rookies will report on July 19th. Of course, the rookies usually report a week early uh, anyway for the Chargers. And then the veterans will report July 26th. So wanted to bring up training camp dates if you are looking to go to training camp. And if you are looking to kind of plan some things out on the day that training camps or on the dates, I should say, that are available to the public. I know Tyler and Steven and probably Arjun are going to be there as well. 
uh, on the dates that are available. So pencil these dates in your calendar and obviously we're going to get a lot of Chargers news, position battle notes, and plenty of content there. But we do have about a month left on the no news machine, which is why, uh, you know, we're just trying to find as much news and stuff to talk about as we can, because that's how sports media works, baby. Uh, but uh, I do think that it'll be uh, interesting to see training camp when it kicks off on July 26th and when the rookies report uh, the week before. Of course, uh, the one thing that I think is interesting to note, uh, as opposed to previous seasons, that the Chargers do actually have all of their rookies signed uh, after they signed JT Woods. So this has been a thing going into past years where I've, maybe they've had one or two rookie free agents uh, that they haven't signed. I think they signed Rashawn Slater a, like a week before training camp last year, or maybe it was even into training camp. Uh, Justin Herbert was a similar situation. So the fact that they have gotten all their draft picks taken care of, uh, I think is a big deal heading into training camp as well. Uh, this comes from Eric Smith, the new senior writer for the Chargers. So congrats to him, obviously, for getting that position uh, with the team. And uh, yeah, no, he's also, uh, he'll jump on the podcast. I've already talked to him. So he's going to be a uh, hoot to have on the podcast at some point, but he is working on a move right now uh, and has a new, uh, new baby that just came. So he is a little bit of a busy man. But Eric Smith wrote about Brandon Staley's uh, press conferences for minicamp and brought up a note that me and Kyle brought up, I think, on one of our uh, post minicamp shows uh, that we did, which is that Brandon Staley has talked about Nasir Adderley and Jalen Guyton as the two players that have st uh, stood out during off-season workouts, noting Jalen Guyton's work on special teams, uh, noting you know Nasir's uh, importance in that safety rotation. So this is not necessarily anything new. But again, I think Jalen Guyton, you know, doing work as that gunner on special teams, really contributing uh, in all aspects of the game is going to be important for this, you know, role on his, uh, the role on the team going forward. And when we talk about a little bit of that Guyton-Palmer 3A, 3B dynamic when it comes to wide receiver, if Jalen Guyton is really this important and is viewed as a breakout candidate and is doing all these things for the team, that might give him that edge when we do talk about that wide receiver depth chart conversation even if it isn't necessarily the most important thing. And I think for Nasir Adderley, when you talk about his importance in his role this season, I think I think sometimes it's talked about as in, you know, almost the certainty that he's probably not going to be back next year just because of the Chargers cap situation after all the additions of this year, the fact that they have to sign Derwin James to an extension. So it's a little bit pricey. They did just take JT Woods, right? Kind of signaling that on some level. Not that they're going to be comfortable moving off of Nasir Adderley, but because of the cap situation, because of just how football and turnover works in the NFL, um, they're going to have to kind of move on from him at some point. But th this does make it so they leave the door, of course, to him potentially returning. But that depends on the year he has. If you know Nasir Adderley has a year similar to his other seasons, I guess it would be possible that he still kind of could be in the bring back price range. If he really does have a breakout season, though, he's probably gone, right? And this kind of talks, you know, Kyle on our channel talks about comp picks all the time, and Asir Adderley certainly factors into that conversation if a team is willing to give him a big contract uh, and you know, the Chargers can collect on some of those comp picks. So, But for this season, for 2022, I think it's very important, especially because both players will be free agents. I think uh, Nasir Adderley will be an unrestricted free agent next year. Jalen Guyton will be a restricted free agent next year. But either way, both these guys are going to be free agents and are going to be in airing contract years with critical roles. And the coach has seemingly uh, you know, penciled them in both as breakout candidates. So that's certainly a situation to watch going forward. And the last thing that I want to talk about today is Trey Pipkin's interview with Daniel Popper over at The Athletic. Uh, so we haven't Mentioned it on the channel to this point, but this comes directly from Popper. Chargers tackle Trey Pipkins eyes the starting job at right tackle after a productive offseason. Um, so I thought this article was really interesting. Obviously, we know that there's going to be a competition largely between Trey Pipkins and Storm Norton to get that right tackle job as uh, training camp goes on, as the offseason program goes on. And, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see who ultimately can land that job. Um, but this was a really interesting interview where Trey Pipkins has talked about some of the steps he's taken to maybe get closer to that job. Um, 
This is from Trey Pipkins himself. I just knew I wanted to go somewhere where I could get a lot of good O-line work in the offseason, along with lifting and running and stuff. Um, this is obviously talking about Trey Pipkins going to Dallas, participating in Duke Manny Weathers' offseason program. So that's good to hear, obviously. Uh, I kind of talked their ear off about it and just decided to go down there and see what it was all about. So Pipkins is working with Duke Mannyweather. So that's going to be interesting to watch going forward. Obviously Slater and a lot of other, you know, these other guys at O-line masterminds also work with Duke Mannyweather. So this is not just a, a Pipkins thing, but rather an NFL thing in general uh, where they do these offensive linemen, you know, training camps, you know, effectively for, uh, you know, development and stuff like that. Uh, Pipkins said, I'm excited to get into training camp, really, uh, you know, apparently grinning towards Daniel Popper when he asked that question. Uh, and Pipkins talks about some of his performance last year. Now, obviously, uh, people kind of remember the Trey Pipkins games that he started at the end of last year uh, when he uh, when Storm Norton went on the COVID list and, you know, the team had to kind of deal with that. So uh, Pipkins kind of talked about those two games, but also Pipkins talked about when he was the offensive lineman in jumbo packages earlier in the year and had some really bad games, right? Uh, there was the effort against the Ravens in week six, and then um, Chargers went into their bye, and Pipkins suddenly was inactive uh, on game days from week eight to week 11. Uh, and that was something that he talked about in this interview saying, quote, I was irritated with myself. Uh, so the fact that, uh, you know, that was a big thing for Trey Pipkins in terms of, you know, just waiting for that chance that would come for him, you know, later in the season, uh, is something that it was worth mentioning, I thought, in this interview, because we do often talk about the the weeks later in the season with Trey Pipkins, where he did start and he did look good. But I think, you know, it, it's worth noting where the transformation started for Pipkins uh, to get him to that place, particularly with being benched earlier in the season. Uh, and then, you know, Pipkins waited for another chance and it eventually came in week 15. Popper writes in a primetime Thursday showdown with the Chiefs. First place in the AFC West was on the line. Slater was unavailable uh, after being placed on the COVID-19 list, and Pipkins was the next man up. He got the start at left tackle and played the best game of his career. He was stout in pass protection. He was a force as a run blocker. Uh, and then the following week, he did not allow a single pressure in 67 offensive snaps. So this is a quote from Trey himself getting out there and showing that I could still play tackle. That was big for me because I knew I could still do it. I wanted to prove people, uh, prove to people that I deserve to be here and playing. Um, and I think the most important thing from this interview is not necessarily what Trey Pipkins is saying, but also what Daniel Popper writes here, which is that those two games from Trey Pipkins turned heads inside the Chargers building. So the Chargers kind of went like, oh, well, here's that, you know, this tackle we have on the roster in Trey Pipkins. He's here, see if he develops or not. And those two games seem to, you know, prove to the Chargers that, yes, he is developing. Uh, you know, Daniel Popper talks about how players develop at different speeds uh, and that that was a, a reality, you know, shift for the Chargers in how they view Trey Pipkins. I think that is a big deal going forward in terms of who you would project to win the right tackle job. Uh, I, I do think it is kind of full steam ahead for Pipkins at this point, uh, unless it, you know, he does lose it in the offseason. But that certainly gives you a, a prettier picture of where Trey Pipkins kind of stands in terms of how the organization views him, um, at least at this point. And then Trey Pipkins, actually, this was very interesting, got into some of the specific stuff he's been doing. Instead of just saying he's developed, um, he has talked about some of the specific stuff that Manny Weather and the other offensive linemen do. Uh, the best part about it is all these guys are, are that are there, you get to hear so many different ways guys think about the game. The work, the lifting, and the conditioning and stuff is all really good, but the best part was just being around the guys, hearing how they think about their pass sets in certain situations and run blocking uh, these techniques and stuff like that. I think that's what helped the most for sure. And then uh, Pipkins talked specifically about Manny Weather's approach to teaching and coaching the offensive line. Quote, he's so good with the, just the biomechanics behind stuff, stuff that you never think about. O-line coaches are super good with all the football stuff and stuff like that, but they don't necessarily know all the biomechanic stuff that strength coaches know. So Manny Weather kind of knows both aspects of it and the way he implements that stuff into the O-line drills is so cool. And then specifically, uh, he mentioned a slight adjustment that he actually made 
uh, in Daniel Popper's article here. One example Pipkin said was activating the glute muscle on his hind leg in his stance before the snap. On tape, Pipkin showed that he was keeping uh, the muscle relaxed in his stance so that he could put weight on his instep of his foot. At the snap, Pipkins would have to activate his glute muscle to explode into his set. And that was a millisecond he lost in the initial movement. So then Pipkin said his adjustment to that was as soon as I would start to move, my knee would lock to activate my glute to push off. And if you stay activated, you can push off without the extra movement. And, you know, maybe that seems like a very minor thing, like Popper notes here, but if you have a millisecond, you know, difference between what you can kind of gain if you just make an adjustment, that can be the difference between Justin Herbert obviously taking a really bad sack, or that can be the difference between standing up a pass rusher, uh, like a Max Crosby who's screaming off the edge, right? Uh, so I thought that that was a very interesting kind of example Pipkins mentioned in his development. Uh, it's just little stuff like that that makes a huge difference, Pipkins added. I've changed a lot about my set that I like and I feel really good about. So Trey Pipkins, uh, you know, whether or not he really breaks out at the right tackle position, whether or not he wins the job remains to be seen. Uh, but he is seemingly developing with Duke Mannyweather right now and saying all the right things. So we will obviously cover all of that in Chargers training camp and see where we lie by the end of it. Um, but that is it for the Chargers news and notes this week. So hope you guys enjoyed this little video. We will be doing our top 10 quarterbacks video tomorrow. Join our YouTube memberships as always. Uh, there's a link in the comments down below. Join the channel, subscribe, do all that good stuff. And I will see you guys tomorrow.